Hello, this is the luckiest maths teacher in the world. Thank you so much for tuning into this video in which we will go through row reduction of a matrix. So first, let's look at what is motivating this. So let's say I have a system of simultaneous equations that I want to solve. So let's say I have the equations y equals 4, x equals 5. So obviously, the solution to this simultaneous equation is really, really simple. It's just going to be the point 5, 4. If I graph this line and this line, they intersect at this point. So I just want to show you that I can do certain things to these equations and not change the solution. The first thing I can do is I can switch the order of these equations. If I write it as x equals 5 first and y equals 4, I haven't changed anything. The solution is still 5, 4. So that probably seems very trivial to you, like, of course that's true, why would I even mention that? But it's important I go through these to show you why we do row reduction. So another thing that I can do is I can multiply each of these equations by a scalar. So that means I can just multiply everything in the equation by any real number and it won't change the solution. So for example, I could times the first equation by two and get two X equals 10. I haven't changed the solution. The solution to this equation is still X equals five. I could times the bottom equation by minus one and get minus Y equals minus four. If I solve these two equations simultaneously, the answer is still, guess what? Five, four. I haven't actually change the solutions. Another thing I can do is I can add multiples of one equation to the other. So I can add multiples of the equations together and I will not change the solution. So for example, I have y equals 4 and x equals 5. So I could just add them together and get x plus y equals 4 plus 5, which is 9. I haven't actually changed the solution. This is still the solution to the equation. I could add multiples of each equation. I could say that x, which is 5, plus 2 times y is 5 plus 2 times 4, which is 13. And I still have the same solution. If I want to solve these two equations simultaneously, I will get the solution x equals 5 and y equals 4. So why am I telling you this? Well, we actually represent simultaneous equations as matrices. And we're going to go through that a bit more next lesson. Because I can do this with equations, I can actually do this to the rows of a matrix. And that's what row reduction is. It's performing one or more of these operations consecutively to reduce the matrix so the numbers are easier to work with. And that is generally our strategy when we're solving simultaneous equations or even linear equations with one variable. We reduce the equation to something that's easier to solve. Even when we're solving a very simple equation like 2x plus 1 equals 7, we reduce it to an easier equation to solve. That's what we can do here. We can take simultaneous equations and reduce them to something easier to solve. So when we're looking at a matrix, each row is its own equation. Again, we'll look at how to represent them properly next lesson. So what I can do for row reduction is I can switch the rows of a matrix. I can multiply a row by a scalar, or I can add multiples of each row together because each equation is a row. And what I want to do is I want to make the matrix easier to work with. So what we're going to look at is reducing a matrix into row echelon form and then we're going to look at something called reduced row echelon form because these matrices are so easy to deal with. So the goal in simultaneous equations, we start with a matrix that's really complicated. If we reduce it into this form, then the equations will become really, really easy to solve. 
much, much easier to solve than when you started. I should point out though, row reduction isn't just used for solving systems of simultaneous equations. It's also really helpful in helping us determine things like the rank of a matrix, which we'll look at later. So row echelon form has three conditions. A matrix is in row echelon form if it satisfies these three conditions. All non-zero rows are above all rows of zeros. Each leading entry of a row, so a leading entry is the first element in that row that's non-zero. It needs to be in a column to the right of the leading entry above it, and all entries below a leading entry are zero. So let's look at an example of matrices that are or aren't in row echelon form. So we now have two matrices here before you. So the first one is in row echelon form because it satisfies those three points. So just to point out, this is the leading entry of the first row. This is the leading entry of the second row. There's no leading entry in the third row. So you can see the leading entry in the second row is two is in a column to the right of the one in the first row. So number two is satisfied. Number one is clearly satisfied because the row of zeros is on the bottom and all entries below the leading entry are zero. So we can see below the first leading entry, there's zero, and below the second leading entry, there's zero. So that one is in row echelon form. The second one, it turns out, is not. So why is that? Well, a couple of reasons. Firstly, there are no zero rows, so the first one doesn't apply. But if we look at the second one, the leading entry here in row one and is here in row two. So the leading entry in row two is actually to the left of the one of the column of the leading entry in row one. So number two is not satisfied. Also number three isn't satisfied because this entry here is below a leading entry but isn't zero. So it turns out we could actually make this in row echelon form if we just swapped the first and second rows around. So now we're just going to look at what it means for a matrix to be in reduced row echelon form. So reduced row echelon form has the same three conditions as row echelon form plus two more. So to be in reduced row echelon form, it has to satisfy these three conditions, plus it also has to have each leading entry being one, and each leading entry being the only non-zero entry in its column. So let's look at some examples of matrices that are or aren't in reduced row echelon form. So again, the first matrix here is in reduced row echelon form because it satisfies all the axioms. So the leading entries are all one and they're the only non-zero entry in its column. This one on the right, it is not in reduced row echelon form. It is actually in row echelon form, but although the leading entry in each non-zero row is one, it isn't the only non-zero entry in its column. So because this is not zero and these aren't zero, that means the fifth condition there isn't satisfied. Okay, so reduced row echelon form matrices are much easier to work with than even row echelon form matrices. So let's look at how we actually get a matrix into reduced row echelon form. So each matrix is equivalent to one and only one reduced row echelon matrix. That means when I start with any matrix, there's only one possible answer of putting it in reduced row echelon form. So how do we actually do this? You start with a matrix and you just keep applying row operations one after the other, those three row operations that I went through on the previous slide. So let's actually start with a matrix and put it in reduced row echelon form. So we have here our matrix A. We are now going to put this in reduced row echelon form. So sorry to tell you, this can take a while. So what we want, we want each element on the leading diagonal to be 1 and each element off the leading diagonal to be 0. So we're going to change elements one by one using the row operation. So it's easiest if we go in this way. If we proceed like this, we'll be able to use rows that we've previously changed to help us change the next element. So that's what we're going to do. So we start at the one, one element. Now that's already one, 
this one here, so I don't need to do anything to change that. I'll leave it as it is. Let's go to the next one here, too. I want that to be a zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the second row. I need to perform an operation on it so that that two becomes a zero. So what I can do is I can take row two and minus two lots of row one. If I do that, the first row will not change. The second row will. I have two minus two times one is zero. Minus two minus two times three gives me minus eight. And then minus one minus two times six gives me minus 13. So the second rows change. Now, if I look at the third row, I don't need to change this element here. So I'm going to leave the third row as it is now. Okay, so I've reduced the matrix for a start. So now I want to concentrate on this element here. What I'm going to do is make it zero. So I can do that by adding a half of row two. So I'm going to take row three and I'm going to add a half of row two. Okay, that's one of the row operations I can use. So hopefully you can see now, because these are both zero, uh, zero plus a half of zero doesn't change it. It's still going to be zero. So four plus a half of negative eight, and then I get three plus a half of negative 13, which is three minus 6.5. I get that one there. Okay, it's okay if the numbers aren't whole numbers. So that's row three done. I didn't change row one at all. I want to change row two, and I'm just going to do this in sort of the same operation. I want this one here to become a one. So I can take row two, as it is up here, and I can times everything by negative one eighth. So because I've already done this one as zero, it won't change it. So I get zero, negative eight times an eighth, and then I get negative one eighth times negative 13. And you keep going on like this. So now I wanna change this one here. I can change that to a zero by subtracting three lots of row two. Good that I already did this one because it won't change the one in row one. That's the first row done, and I didn't change the second row or the third row, okay? So now I'm almost there, I just need to change these two elements. So it turns out because I have the two zeros here, what I can do is I can just subtract a multiple of this last row, so that each of them become zeros. So then, when I do that, I'm just skipping the step for time here, I'm going to end up with a matrix that looks like this. 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and then 0, 0, minus 3.5. But hang on a minute, I can just times the bottom row by negative 1 over 3.5, and I can change that, and that will become a positive 1. So this matrix is now in row reduced form, reduced row echelon form. So it turns out that when I've reduced it, I've got what looks like the identity matrix, I3. You won't always get that matrix, but it will look something like that. You may have a row of zeros instead. You may have a few rows of zeros or whatever, okay? But just following these processes eventually gets me to something that looks like this. It can take a while, but it's a very important skill to be able to do. All right, sorry for the long video. This has been the luckiest maths teacher in the world. Have a great day.